What's up, everyone? Coach Tony here. Welcome back to Ivy League Admission Secrets. This week's training is going to be on the SAT, the ACT. A quick little testing update. Uh, it is the end of June 2024. The test environment is changing up a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and just share some updates, share some trends, share some uh, learnings that we've had talking to a few admission folks over these past few weeks as well. So if you are here, welcome, welcome. Every single Thursday, we go live and do training specific to uh, Ivy's, Ivy Plus, the top 20, top 30, top 50 colleges for you guys to help you guys get uh gain the unfair advantage in the college admissions process. We'll show you guys what's working for our students and share kind of what we're what we're seeing so you guys can kind of do the same with your families here. Today's training is going to be on the SAT ACT update. We just did an update like a month or two ago. So for a lot of the tactical how to prep for the SAT and all that, uh, let us know in the chat. We can give you guys that training as well too. But today is more of a quick little update, right? Quick little update of kind of what's going on is number one, right? In the test field. And what does that mean, right? So that means, should I do stuff? Should I not do stuff about it? Because this is the year where things are starting to change a little bit, right? So for those who remember the good old days back in the day, right? The SAT was a required any. The ACT was a required any. For the sake of this training, I'm just going to say SAT. You guys will know that the SAT and the AC are equivalent. There's no test that any school requires more than the other. I'm just going to say SAT because it makes, makes it easier. Or I might even have some fun and say ACT. Anytime I mention either of those words, it means both, right? So both of them, both exams are the same when I when we refer to this. So back in the day, right, these were required exams, right? These were part of the application process itself. So any single student who applied, you submitted your classes, your grades, you submitted your test scores, your activities, and then your essays, right? So that was part of the whole thing there. What happened was back in 2020, right, the world shut down. The world shut down. As a result, testing centers shut down. As a result, students weren't able to submit their scores, or, or actually they couldn't even take their tests. They couldn't take their tests as a result, they couldn't submit their scores either. So as a result of that, schools all over went test blind for a year. Test blind, some people call it test free, right? Meaning you don't need the test scores to submit. You can still just submit with your academics, submit with your activities, submit with your essays, right? So that, that's what happened. As a result of that, that's also the year, if you guys look at the trends, there's a huge spike. It was a big spike in the number of applications submitted to these various colleges and universities, right? So massive spike, a lot more students to think about, right? Then recently, then one of the first schools to kind of bring it back the, immediately the next year, MIT was one of the very first schools to bring it back after a year. Boom, we're going to require it no matter what. You guys got to figure out. So 2021, people actually had to drive out to certain places because certain states didn't even open it up yet either. But MIT set the precedent. They were like, we are requiring it no matter what. And they've had it. The only one year was 2020 when they did, but every other year they have required it since. As a result, right, um, this last year, this past year right now, literally this year, uh, a lot of the Ivy League colleges all stated right, that they are bringing back some form of test required, right? They're, they're all using creative names. I think Columbia is the only one that pledged test uh, for a test optional. But the other Ivies, they all said their variation of test required. For example, like Yale, they're calling it test test flexible. If you, if you look it up, they're gonna, they call it test flexible. Does that mean you have to do it? Okay, yes, <laughs> that's, that's what that means, test flexible means. So the Ivies start to bring it back. And usually if you look how admission works, again, a lot of our families are going through the college admissions process for the very first time. So you kind of seeing it happen in real time. We've been doing this for like 16 years now. This is nothing's, nothing's new, right? So everything's a pattern. What happened last time any big shift happened? What happened, anything drastic happened, right? It's always the same exact formulas. The Ivies are the ones who take a stand and say, we are doing this. We are, this is the, the plan. Then as a result of that, it starts to trickle, 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 trickle to more and more schools. 
right? So the IVs just went test required, which means if you're applying to any of the IVs, we have no choice. We have to bring back the test, uh, the testing prep as part of the admissions kind of prepping cycle. Luckily that for the last few years, a lot of our students, we got to skip it, right? A lot of our students were not the greatest test taker. So it helped us to our advantage. Like, dude, we don't need it. Let's just skip it and do well because, right? We could we study? The answer is yes, right? I think so a little segue. We do have another training on this for those who are interested. But we to see an increase in your score, you can study from. These are still standardized tests. As a result of that, right, you could study to get the better score. There's only so many. I talked to a student earlier today. There's only so many questions that they test you on that as long as you exhaust all of the material, you fully understand the things. That's how students get really good scores. Right? That's pretty much it, right? So what we see as a studying metric is if you want to go up by 100 points, that's usually about one month of study, right? So if you're like 13, you try to go to 14, right? Then it's like good solid month should get you there, right? Is the thing, right? So the math I would say is tell students that every month, uh, every 100 points you want to increase by, think of it as like one month. However, there is a concept called plateauing, right? When it comes to plateau, can you have a big jump? You can, but usually we find at the 200-ish point mark is when it starts to get really tough as well too. Maybe when, you, if, if, let's say you start at a much lower score, the higher increase is a little easier, relative, right? Relative easier. But once you're already at like the 1300 range, getting up 200 points or even higher is getting really difficult. Again, marginal returns, the more you study there. So we always tell our families, hey, if you need to increase your score by 100 points, study hard for a month. If you go 200-ish points, right, that's about uh, that's about two, three months studying there. Again, different topic. We have a whole like breakdown of how to study all that there too. But kind of going back, right? Kind of going back, right? So if you're applying to any of the test required schools, aka the Ivies, right, for a very baseline, there are other schools too. There's Georgetown that made it required. The newest school on the list, Stanford. This past week, Stanford also announced they are also bringing back tests required for this upcoming year as well. So a lot of schools are starting to bring this back. That is now a requirement. So if it is required, you kind of have no choice. We have to take it, right? The unfortunate thing, <laughs> the unfortunate thing of all this is that a lot of testing centers are full. Right, they're I think they're full all the way out to like October. I heard from some of our students from some of the areas uh, that we are uh, our students are from. So you got to prep early. If we know we have to do it, you have to put something on the books and submit that score there. So keeping that in mind is number one. Right. Something else to keep in mind is when so what? How is it going to play out? We're going to figure out next year right so every time admission does stuff you see things happen and then it takes a full year to kind of see the results of that right when everyone went test uh blind right for a year it had to happen then we see what happened then we go back and and things uh, kind of adjusted that way some schools stayed blind some schools went back to uh, to optional so every school kind of reacted here this is the first year again that the SAT ACT is going to be required again so again it's like a let's see what's going on However, that being said, we luckily have some friends in some really awesome places. We ask them, hey, at your school, how do you recommend that we tell our students and how they should do the thing? So here's the general recommendation, right? If you're applying again to the Ivy League colleges, if you are at the Ivy League caliber, even if they say some weird words like test flexible, it is definitely required for you. Specifically, what level of required do we want? The number that you want to aim for is the 75th percentile. So how the scores work is they're they're by different percentages, right? So your score, you can see uh, you can see the average of the score and kind of see where the students are falling at. Where we want our students to kind of be at is towards that 75th percentile is kind of where we would like them to be uh, when when they are submitting their prompts that way. Right. So that's one of the big things there. Um, keeping in mind, there's one local, uh, actually, no, so some percentile. 
Uh, that's 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 the biggest thing, right? So that's that's the part of the thing you want to keep in mind. That's the magical number you're looking for. We want to get to that 75th percentile in any kind of way that we want there. If your school is optional, if it's still optional, again, see where you're at and then uh, you may or may not need to do it, right? For those who don't know, like for example, the test optional school, which is still the majority. I think a lot of schools, and if you're not aiming for like the, the ultra top colleges, right? Well, a lot of them are required. If you're aiming for like the next tier of colleges, a lot of them are still optional. If your school is optional, here's the advice for you. If your school is optional, take a full length practice test. Ideally, if you can actually take a proctor test, right? Because again, if you're taking a practice, there's no pressure, right? You're not really mimicking the reason why students, some students do really well on their practice practice exams, but do really bad on the test. It's not because they don't know the material. It's because they were nervous, right? They were nervous because they're sitting in a very proctored room and it feels like a testing center and, or it is a testing center. That's why it's freaking them out. So they know the material, but nerves got to them. That's why their score is lower. So something we recommend our students try is a proctored practice exam. Again, I bet you in your city, there are dozens, if not hundreds of testing centers that prep students for the SAT. What you would want to do is ask them, call around and see locally, right? Do they do proctored practice tests, right? Usually they do a lot of test testing centers. That's one of the things that they do when they bring on new families in their program. They do like a proctored test with their correct time limits, with the breaks, with everything, exactly how it's done during test day to kind of mimic that. That way your child's going to get you go through that once they're used to it. And they're like, oh, that's not so scary. So those nerves are gone. Right is the biggest thing, right? So take a take a practice test. Once you take a practice test, look at the average score that you're going to get, right? Uh, 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 look at the score that you get. And then look at the average score of the school that you're trying to apply to. Because even though schools are optional, right? People still submit their scores. So as a result, the schools will have the data on this, what the average score was. For those test optional school, your goal is to beat the average, right? If you're in the average or beat the average, go ahead and submit that test score. It's only going to help you with that admissions process itself. And for the schools that are test-free, right? Meaning test-blind, meaning they don't even look at the exams. Two very popular schools that are top-ranked, that are test-optional, uh, that are test-free and test-blind, UCLA, UC Berkeley. Those two schools have remained test-free for, for the last four years. I predict they will still continue to stay test-free, test-blind for the foreseeable future as well too. Okay, so quick takeaways, right? They are, if it's required, you have to take it. You want to aim to 75th percentile, right? Depending on how much it is, you do want to prep to make sure you do well there. If you're taking, if you're incoming class of 2025, right? You guys start looking into exams now. I think a lot of the August dates are gone, right? So you have to probably look at the next one, which is like October. Look into October slots. Again, do you have to travel? Like some summer students are like, hey, I have to go two hours or three hours to get to the next testing center. That's up to you. Like figure out that college, right? Because again, if you're only doing it for one school, let's say your whole list and you just had Stanford now and Stanford is now officially test required, right? If you have Stanford and you're like, if that's the only test required school you do, the question is how bad do you want to go to Stanford? Does the rest of your application match a Stanford? Because if you're just banking on, I just have a good score, right? That might not be it, right? Then that might be, a, let's figure out your cause list and figure out like, is it worth it to study? Because again, this is a bigger topic now. If you're going to spend time on studying for the SAT or the ACT, you're not spending the time on the other areas. You're not spending the time on your academics. You're not spending time on your activities. If you're a senior, you're not spending time on your application. Those other three things could play a bigger role in admissions than your test score itself. So it's a lot of it is evaluation, kind of seeing where you're at there, okay? One last quick thing before we uh, bounce out for today is the idea of a super score. You also see a lot of schools now ask for a super score, right? So when it comes to super scoring, this is when if you take multiple exams, they'll take the best score from each of your exams, add it together, right? So hypothetically, right? This is the, this is the far extreme. The hypothetically extreme number one, if you got a 800, which is the maximum in math and got a zero, in English, which by the way, is impossible. The lowest score is 200, but let's assume extreme, right? Zero in English, 800 in math. 
And then you took it again another time and you got zero in math, 800 in English, right? So those are your two scores. A super score, we would add the two best scores together, means the English and one, 801, the 800 from the math, put that together, you're going to end up with a super score of 1600. That's how super scoring works. However, if you're applying to these, again, top schools, these elite schools as well too, they still see every single testing site, every test uh, administration that you do. So they will see that zero. You're going to open some, some worms of like, hmm, what happened here? The other zero, huh, you got 800 last time. What happened here as well too? A lot of people will start to put one-on-one -on -one together that you're trying to game the system as well too. Again, with all students who got accepted to these types of schools, they're not trying to game the system. They are just very good and they got in. When people are trying to do stuff to look good, do stuff to try to get ahead, they tend not to do really well, right? So I'll tell you a lot of our advice you'll see is never to do stuff to look good. That's, that was never the intention. Some things might end up looking good, right, for us, but the initial approach for all our things has never been what looks good for college, let's do that, right? It's always been what makes the most sense, let's follow that path as well too, okay? So if you are gonna super score your scores, not every school does, but the schools that do, for some students, unless your score is really off, we would actually recommend students submit a lower score at one sitting than submitting a super score if the scores were really drastic as well too. So if you had like, again, a very extreme, 800, 0, 0, 800, then that's a 1600 uh, super score, right? That's a little extreme. We probably won't recommend that, but if let's say you have like a 600, 600-ish, right? That actually might be a little better than the full 800, 0, 0, 800, because that is a one sitting test, okay? Cool. That's pretty much it for this little trade. Again, a quick little update, quick little, little summary here. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and start dropping them in the chat. But the quick summary here, again, a lot of schools are getting tests required now. They're following the suit of the, the IVs. I do predict over the next few months, there will be more and more and more schools that will start to do it. There will be certain schools that will not, right? There will be certain schools that will not. They will stay test blind. Uh, if the schools that you are interested in applying to are test required, we have no option. We have to study and include the prep for these exams inside our studying schedule. In terms of that, every 100 points you want to increase, right? So first, I'll take a practice test, see what your baseline is. Every 100 points you want to add, it should take about 100, uh, 100, take about a month, right? Every 100 points is one month with uh, the, the plateau we start to see around a plus 200 points. And can you go more? Of course you can, but usually we see a plateau start to happen at that point right there. You know, go ahead and take it for the recommended timeline here. Uh, if you are an incoming, so seniors, if you're applying to school, and school like for example, Stanford, lat this week, just enforced it. Hey, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. But ideal timeline, right? Ideal timeline, if you are an incoming junior, as of this recording, 20, class of 2026, right? If you're a class of 2026, you can go ahead and um, you can go ahead and prep for this, right? And then, so your exams, you should take it your second semester of junior year, right? Keeping in mind, in, as, junior, as juniors, you have the PSAT. Usually everyone takes this in October. This one actually qualifies you for national merit if you did well. So it's like if, like, if you do well, right? If you do well on this test, you can qualify for national merit. That is potentially a full ride scholarship. Um, every state has their own cutoff number. So you got to figure out what your state's cutoff number is. Just Google it, uh, state PST cutoff number. And that's the score you know. You can take a practice test and see how close you are to that score. If you're within 100 points, I will study hard because you have a really good shot at getting it. If you're not even 100 points away, you're like two, 300 points away, it's not worth it. You can take the PST as a practice test, but I personally wouldn't treat it as like a, let's do really, let's go really hard on this exam because again, it's a practice as well too there, okay? Uh, but going back full circle, if you take it if it's required, <coughs> submit it as well too. Uh, and where you want to aim is the 75th percentile of the school whatever that means, because every school's ranges are a little different. 
So you do want to submit that for test required schools. When it comes to test optional schools, you want to hit at the 50th percentile or the average uh, of the scores and submit that to help you guys out there. Okay. All right. Does USC require as of today? I don't believe so. I can, I can do a quick search. University of California, Southern California, test required. Nope. They have, they, uh, Applicants will not be penalized or put advantage if they do not choose to not submit uh, the thing. So USC, no, USC is test optional as of this upcoming year. Yep, optional there. Uh, another question in the chat, um, are the SATs, uh, ACTs practice available on Discord? I believe so. Just do a search for practice test. We should have it. If not, you can look them up. So the ACT and the SAT do have their own practice tests on their websites. They, I think they have two or three of them available for free. So for ST, SAT, go to the College Board. ACT is an ACT student or I think ACT.org in general. Look up practice tests. They sh each of them should have practice tests you guys can go through uh, to do like that, like that, that diagnostic, right? That first, that first uh, test that you take to see your scores. Definitely do that there. Um, another question here is if university are test op test optional, will they prefer candidates with tests over those who do not submit? That's a great question. So when schools say test optional, they truly mean test optional. It's not a trick to see who's gonna do it, who's not gonna do it as well, right? So the big thing here again, there's a difference between rec recommended and optional. So optional means you don't have to do it. Recommended means you should do it, right? So keeping that in mind is is the distinction there. So when it comes to schools that are optional, no, because most of our students, by the way, these last few years who applied to test optional schools, we had most of our students not submit. I think close to 70% of our students not even take the test, nor if they took it, they didn't even submit the exam to test optional schools and they all got it. So it's, it's, not, it's not a thing that you have to do it. When they say optional, it truly means optional. Keeping in mind in like, if you kind of take a step back real fast from all this, right? There's kind of three components of admission that's really important. The academics, the activities, and the application. Test scores will fall under academics. For us, academics is the least important factor of admission. So again, you can spend a lot of time on this section, but there's other things you can do that does play a bigger role in your success or not. So um, the answer is, do they prefer? No, but if you have a good score, they will, that will, they will consider it and that will boost your application as well too. Um, how the PST different than the SAT? The con in other words, can you prep for the SAT and be ready for the PSAT? Yes, exactly. Yes. So that's kind of what we'd recommend our students to do is if you're studying for the PST, I wouldn't prep for the PST. I would prep for the SAT, right? As well. And then the scores should be very similar. You'll see that the, the PST the, is the, this is the in the SAT there's like the thousands right sixteen hundreds one six zero zero right or like fifteen hundred one five zero zero one five zero zero the PST drops drops the last number so it's just like one fifty one forty one thirty and that's six times ten and that's like the equivalent ish number that's why again if you're just taking the PSAT as a uh, as a practice. If you add a zero at the end of your score, that's probably what you have gone if you took the SAT yourself. Which grade should the students start prepping for the SAT? It's a great question. I tell students, start not, not prepping, just you start in sophomore year when you take the PSAT. I tell students, do not study for this test in sophomore year because a score means nothing. If you get a perfect score, nothing happens. You get the worst score ever, nothing happens, right? So it's, it's nothing there. However, right, junior year, the reason why we do this test is to see what's our baseline. And I purpose I tell students don't study because I do want to see your true baseline. No studying, natural knowledge in your brain. What score are you at, right? Because based on that, I will tell a student, yes, study for the PST 11th grade or don't even try again. If you're really close, try. If you're not close, don't try. Close is like 100 points. If, like, if you're in the 1400 range, Right. And then what, what score I'm looking for? What I'm score I'm looking for is gonna be the um the 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 cutoff, right? The, 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 it's called the National Merit Cutoff, right? That's a big acronym, N M Q something, right? N look up national merit, your state, there'll be a number. That's the number you're gonna try to hit. It's like once you pass a number, you're a national merit finalist, right? That's pretty much it. So that's the big thing to keep in mind. 
um, let's assume now you go down to trash to 10th grade, you didn't do so hot. 11th grade, you didn't, you didn't do so hot. PSAT, but you have to take the SAT, right? This is not how you have to do it. Then I would tell a student, you want to prep spring semester of uh, junior year. So starting January-ish time or even a little later, that's when you kind of want to start-ish, right? So when it comes to that, uh, the big thing is, um, again, use the, the benchmarks. If you need to only bump up 100 points, about a month. If you need to bump up like 200-ish points, maybe two, three months, same thing. Anything higher, you want to do a little more on that. But keeping in mind, how high do you need to go? And it's relative as well, too. Uh, do Does engineering or med school prefer the part... Prefer a particular uh, test score? No, like ST or is it? No, again, they're both literally equivalent, right? No schools were like, no, we prefer this over the other back in the day, right? Back in the day, uh, it was one of those, the ACT was a more commonly accepted East Coast thing. ST was a more commonly uh, accepted West Coast thing. Ever since the two tests have been around as well too, they're literally identical as well too. So nothing really changes there. Keeping in mind the difference now, however, the ST is digital, right? The ST is still old school. The, the, the ST is digital. That is the new twist, the new difference between the two tests nowadays is that the digital SAT is digital. However, if you, I'm not going to talk about today, but if you guys want to Google it, there was a massive issue <laughs> with the digital ST. I think like the internet went out or something and then messed up like a few thousand student scores. The college board is not going to do anything about it is, is, the, is the biggest thing. So it's... We all have thoughts about the test, but I'm just sharing what the thing is. But yeah, do we prefer? No. And they're both kind of similar. Oh, one other difference. The ACT does have a science section. However, it's not science. Meaning the science section, you can know nothing about science and still get a perfect score in the ACT. The reason why is the ACT does not test your knowledge of science. It tests your ability to read science graphs. So if you're strong in math or data analysis, you'll do really well in that part too. There's no, there's no, no and then anything science you need to know, they explain to what the thing is anyway. So you don't have to know anything about science. As long as you can read a chart, a table, a graph, you should be good to go there. For the ACD, how much uh, studying is to raise by a point? Uh, Usually like a month, right, is, is the thing. If you look at the equivalency between the SD and the ACT, 100-ish points, about like a point difference as well too. Uh, the keeping in mind, it gets a little tougher the higher you go up. Right? That's why like, yeah, let's, let's say your, your starting score ACT is like, uh, AC, ACT is out of 36, by the way, right? Let's say you're starting at 18. To go from 18 to 20 to even 24 is not that hard, right? The issue is going from 30, 33 to 34, from 34 to 35, 35, 36. Those are the hardest ones to do because it's like so, like the, again, the return is so tiny as well too. But again, as you're starting from a lower number, it's much easier to show a bigger increase up as well too. Okay. Well, great questions, everyone. I think that's it. One more, one last one. Any advantage of SD versus the ACT, the digital aspect is intimidating. It depends on who you are as a person, right? The other big thing is how the test is, uh, how the, the format is, right? Again, the SAT is a uh, little harder questions, less questions, right? The ACT, ACT has more questions, more questions, easier questions. So that, that's the biggest difference here. Biggest recommendation, take a full length practice test of both. If you're taking the ACT, Take the practice test there. SAT, there is a digital proctor test. So you can see how it is. By the way, how the digital works, it's adaptive. So what adaptive means, that's why like when you take a practice test, it's not super accurate unless you're doing like an adaptive practice test. Um, so the, the biggest difference here is that you're, there's four sections, right? Two math, two English. If you did really well on the math on your first section, assume let's say you had everything right, right? Your second math section will be hard because that's how it is, right? If you didn't do so hot in the first math section, you're gonna get an easier or same level easy, same level rigor on the second math. However, your score is capped. There's no way you can get a perfect score anymore, right? Vice versa, not vice versa, that, that's best shit. That, that, adapt, that's what adaptive means, right? ACT is the same test, everyone takes the same test or the different variations, but pretty much take the same test there. I will take the practice test for both, see how well you do. Some people do do better, <laughs> do do they do do better on the SAT some do do better on the ACT so definitely take that both tests see which one works best again when you're taking a practice test follow the time limits of each section you can actually fun fact 
you can actually break up the test because again, there's four sections each um, and it's like long time. So what you could do, a little trick I've told some students is that take each section each day. So over a week, you'll be happy, you'll be done with the practice test. Because again, and how your the score works in like I don't know, science, right? Is that um if you took each one according to the time limit, when you add the score, that is pretty much what the real exam is gonna look like, anyways, too. So you, you don't have to do all four at once, right? You can, which will help uh, mimic the the fatigue you get. Cause again, just sitting through a test for like three, three hours is like a long time, right? But and that doesn't affect too much of your score. As long as each section you're following at time limits, that's the big thing there. Cool, awesome. It's a pleasure channeling us. Like we had like a over a little hundred people join us tonight. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Hope you hope that was a little helpful for you guys. Hope it was useful for you guys. If you have any questions, go ahead and let us know in the chat. If not, we'll see you guys again next week for another trading on the Ivy Leagues. Catch you guys.